Adam and Eve in the garden. What is the lie? We're going to take a look here at Genesis 3 and what was going on there. And hopefully, unless you're already on board with me here and have come to this knowledge, whether independently or however you've gotten there, um, hopefully this is going to destroy and demolish and irreversibly remove some misconceptions about what was going on in the garden and what that was really all about and as a result it can it can be the foundation for the way that you see the entirety of the bible what the story is what the what the singular unified gospel message is uh what is the nature of god and what kind of relationship do we have with him and i think generally the characterization of what happened in the garden tends to be that there was this rebellion, this essentially screw you, God, we don't need you, we can do it without you, which I don't believe to be the, the case. I think that what actually happened was that Eve was inflicted with fear that there was something that God was not going to provide for her and she needed it and that she had to provide it for herself. And basically that's what the lie is, is that God didn't provide for you something that you need and you need to take it upon yourself and, and find it, achieve it, effort it, whatever by yourself. And so that is a motivation of fear rather than pride. And so I think that pride is given way too much of a, uh, that it's held up as being the motivation for people in, in far in, ex in excess of what people are actually being driven by. I think when it comes to performance-based religion, people are afraid to abandon their performance. They're afraid to trust God. I don't think that they think they're doing such a wonderful, bang-up, awesome job of performing and achieving that they think they're the ones that are going to be the special. In some cases, yes, there are some narcissists that need to be told, get over yourself. You aren't nearly as important or interesting as you think you are. But I think in general, people are just terrified. They've been made to be afraid of God. They've been made to be afraid to to give up performance and i think fear is actually the primary motivation of most people if you look at the self-help section of the bookstore it's filled with books you know it's not it's not really filled with books of of get over yourself nobody likes you you're not really that important why don't you shut up and take a back seat and you don't really need to try and be running the show all the time because uh we don't really like you you're a narcissist. Get over yourself. But what we find instead is that there's book after book, uh, all kinds of whatever materials, you know, videos, DVDs, Blu-rays, uh, movies, uh, online programs, etc., that are designed to try and help convince you that your life does matter. Your voice is important. You can do it if you set your mind to it. Come on, you can do it. The little engine that could, you can do it. You can do it. You know, and the fact is, no, you can't. You can't do it. You're helpless. You're a victim. You can never accomplish anything. Um, give up. And I think people are terrified of that idea. They're, they're absolutely terrified to just give up and say, <laughs> whatever, I'm not even going to try. You know, if God's not going to give it to me, I guess I'm not going to have it. Um. So I don't think people are that driven by pride. I think they're driven by fear. And I think that primarily the the image that most people have of when it comes to how they view the world is that they think that what, what they see in the world is that their lives are absurd, worthless, unimportant, petty, exhausting, banal, glum, uneventful, laborious, tiresome, tedious, dull, trivial, tiresome, irrelevant, insignificant, generic, 
wearisome, dreary, dismal, monotonous, uninteresting, inconsequential, bleak, futile, ineffective, unremarkable, repetitive, mediocre, forgettable, wretched life. And after that, you die. Disintegrate into worm food, and you're slowly but surely forgotten by whatever few people actually cared that you ever existed until one by one, every last person who ever knew you existed dies too. Really, the fear is just of being completely and utterly forgettable and forgotten and of being unloved, uncared for. And so this is what I think is really the thing that motivates people is this just abject fear that they're going to be completely and totally forgotten and insignificant. I really don't think people are overestimating their own self, sense of self-importance on, on such a grand scale that we need to tell people to take their pride and stuff it. I think most people, whatever pride that they do have is, is really just a false effort to cover over the fear that they're actually living in subjection to. Um, so if we take a look at this in, uh, I need to switch over here. We take a look at, oh, did that wrong. Take a look at the chapter here in Genesis 2. So we start out and we see that in verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so we go to chapter 3. And having seen now that the commandment was given to, to Adam. And so Adam had already witnessed everything being made by God. Uh, the, the next passage that we didn't read would, would have been God telling Adam that he needed a partner and then going ahead and making that partner for him, which was Eve. So Adam had no sense that he even had a need, never mind how to fulfill it. God took care of it for him. Adam was in the knowledge of knowing that God was providing everything. He had no reason to feel that anything was being withheld. But Eve was susceptible, was susceptible to this, not having witnessed God make everything. So we see in verse 1, chapter 3, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So she's already been thrown in confusion, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She's already in confusion. She's added touching it to what they're not allowed to do, even though it's just eat of it that they were told not to do. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. So what we see here is that Eve was tricked into believing that God was withholding something from her. And you can see that this is presented in a fashion where God is actually the adversary. That the serpent is presenting this saying, God's withholding something from you purposely because the concept that you would have it is displeasing to him. He doesn't want you to have this thing that you need. So it's up to you to achieve it for yourself. You need to go get it. And again, this is normally characterized as, as Eve being told, hey, you don't need God. You're good to go on your own. You can be just like God um, without God. And I don't really think that's what it is. I think that this is more like you, you tell a child, you know, your mom's not going to take care of you and you need to take care of yourself. The child's not going to go, I don't need my mom. I can do it on my own. They're going to be terrified. They're going to be in absolute terror. Wait, I'm not being cared for? 
I, I have to do it on my own? That's scary. You know, so I think she's being driven by fear, being made to believe that the God who's supposed to care for her is actually her adversary. And so we look at the lie here, and the lie is that God didn't provide something, and he's withholding it from you, and that it's up to you to uh, acquire it on your own, by your own self-effort, by your own performance, by your own achievement. And so we see you need it, God did not provide it. And the first part of this is where the serpent says, um, he says, uh, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So we take this, ye shall be as gods. And so the, the lie here is that there's something that God didn't provide when he actually did provide it. And the lie is blinding you to the fact that you already have it. So, for example, the love of God is not something that you need to perform and achieve and, and you know, hopefully you do a good enough job that God's going to be pleased with you and, and he'll say, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. Like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, when, when Jesus was baptized, uh, God said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. He hadn't actually done anything yet. I mean, and if you look at Genesis 2, Adam named the animals. It wasn't really a, not like the bar was set real high. You know, not to insult Adam or anything, but, is, you know, he was not given a real hard task. It's not like God really wants us to achieve something. He did all the hard work himself. It's just the whole point is to trust him that he provided it. Um, and so there's this lie that's blinding you to the fact that you already have something. And you already have it. There's there's nothing to do. You you need do absolutely zero in order to acquire it. There's no performance or, or achievement or effort needed on your part. It's already there. All you need to do is recognize that it's there and take it. And so I think this is characterized by you shall be as gods because we already know that uh, they were made. We were made to be in the image of God. It says, let us make man in our image. And then it says, we made man in our image. So it sounds to me like ye shall be as gods is actually, if the, if the only lie there is that they weren't already. I mean, not that they were omnipotent and all-powerful creators of the universe, but they were made in the image of God. I don't think, I don't think the motivation here was to exalt themselves above the status where they were. I think it was a trick that made them, made Eve to believe that she was less than she was. Um, so she was blinded to the fact that she was already completely perfect in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, she was already everything that she needed to be. Um, so the second part of the lie is that you need something that God didn't provide, and the lie is that you need it. So then we see here, knowing good and evil... Well, knowing good, God is good. So what was unknown prior to eating of the tree was evil. Well, knowing evil really isn't a benefit. There really isn't an upside to knowing evil. So by knowing evil, all, all that happened was harm came. Um, it's, it's not something that's actually desirable. There's, there's nothing needed in knowing evil. So... Here the lie is that there's something that you need, except that you never, ever actually needed it and never will. It's a completely pointless and counterfeit, vain, contrived, non-existent need that you're being made to believe that you have when you don't have a need for it. So all effort and performance on your part is in the pursuit of something that has no value and never will. So this is the way that I see this is that First they have this lie, you shall be as gods after you eat, the, eat of this tree. But the lie is that they need do anything to be that way because they already are. It's They already have it. It's already there. Just like your salvation is secure, you, you don't need to achieve it. You don't need to perform. You don't need to merit it. 
it's already there. It's secure. It's not going anywhere. You're not going to lose it. Uh, you don't need to keep it. It's it's a promise from God. It's not a performance on our part. It's an inheritance. The the uh, covenant was fulfilled by God on one hand and Jesus on the other. Uh, we're just the inheritors of the testament. Um, you know, so it's not going anywhere. It's already there. And if you, the more you can wrap your mind around how much of this lie is blinding you to the fact that you already have something, you already have it, it's already there. It's not being withheld from you, it's right there. God loves you. He doesn't expect anything from you in order to love you. He already loves you. He loved you before he even made you, and he made you the way he wanted to, you to be. You're not a mistake. You're not broken. You're not defective. You don't have a disease a sin disease. That's another thing I can't stand hearing people. Oh, we have a sin sick. No, we don't. We do not have a sin sickness. Okay. We were made exactly the way that he, we, God wanted us to be, uh, knowing full well what we were going to do. And he loved us unconditionally the way that we are. Um, we, we didn't, we didn't do something here in the garden that caused us to be broken or defective or sick. All it did was move us along into the next stage of the plan. And the plan is that we're supposed to be dependent upon God and have a relationship with him as part of him. And that's the plan. And so recognizing our dependence upon God was part of the plan. So understanding that what happened here was an act of faithlessness. It was an act of unbelief. It was an act of distrust of God, an act of believing that God was an adversary and not really quite so much of saying like, hey, cool, we don't need the God who made us is, uh, you know, a completely different way of looking at it where you see that what they did was act out of fear. And if you follow along after the after this, you can see how much fear that they were in. Um, when, when God then approaches them and says, you know, what's going on? And I think that's, again, that's God being loving and compassionate and realizing that they were in fear and trying to alleviate that. So, you know, he used a, he used a parenting technique that made it a little easier for them to acknowledge what was happening. And we see in verse 21, it says, Unto Adam and also his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And so God took care of everything, even, you know, even offering the substitute that died in their place. So rather than, uh, rather than Adam and Eve dying, a substitute died in their place. God just took care of everything. He did, he did it all. And that's the whole story of the whole Bible is he did everything that needed to be done. So again, that first part of that lie is that there's something he's withholding when it's already there. And the second part is that there's something that you need that you actually don't. You know, so it's just a counterfeit, fake, false, phony, contrived need that you don't actually have. Um, but God's not your adversary. You know, the only one that wants you to believe that God is in any way displeased with you or adversarial to you or expecting a performance from you is the devil. He's the one that wants you to believe, you know, the adversary is the one who wants you to believe that God is the adversary. Um, so that's not how it is. God, we, God loves us first. It wasn't it wasn't a performance on our part that earned his earned his respect that he said, oh, you know. Well, you did such a good job. I guess I'll love you then. So if we go to 1 John 4 and we look at verses 13 to 19, it says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. I don't know, it kind of sounds like you shall be as gods, maybe. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we 
in this world. Again, kind of sounds like you shall be as gods, except that it's not requiring a performance on our part to get there. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. Not because of a performance on our part. 